January 1961. After months of intermittent warfare, fighting in the Congo shows no signs of abating. Regional tensions have intensified with the continuing presence of the Belgian army. Patrice Lumumba, the father of the Congolese independence movement, was recently captured by rebel forces. His condition is currently unknown. For 75 years, Belgian colonialism dominated almost every aspect of Congolese life. Under the guise of paternalism, Belgium restricted Congolese social mobility, political participation, and educational opportunities. Native workers, no matter how skilled, were not promoted and were paid significantly less than their white counterparts. However, in the mid-1950s, the nationalism sweeping Africa struck a nerve in the Belgian Congo. In 1958, due to rising instability, the Belgians were forced for the first time to permit the Congolese to form political parties, which were dominated by local tribes. But none of these could gather national support in the tribally diverse Congo. Only one party, the Non-Tribal Movement National Congolais, or MNC, succeeded on a national scale. Its strength came from the personality and power of its leader, Patrice Lumumba. Patrice Lumumba, who started adulthood as a clerk, was initially moderate on the issues of independence and reform. This changed dramatically at the 1958 All-African People's Conference in Accra, Ghana, where African nationalists met to discuss the creation of an independent Pan-African community. Lumumba's contact with Kwame Nkrumah, the president and founder of Ghana, cemented his beliefs in the need for immediate independence. He came to Ghana a clerk, the head of a little-known party, and left the man who would change not only the Congo, but all of Africa. Just after the conference, bloody riots shook the city of Leopoldville. Beneath the previously calm surface, the Congo had been torn apart. There seemed to be only one way to restore order. On January 13, 1959, King Baudouin of Belgium announced that his country would grant the Congo independence. However, King Baudouin had intentionally named no date. The king planned to hold on to the Congo for as long as possible. But instead, the instability in the Congo increased as nationalist leaders, most notably Patrice Lumumba, pushed for immediate independence. The Belgians recognized negotiations were unavoidable and set a series of talks with the Congolese, the Roundtable Conference, to begin on January 20, 1960, in Brussels. The Belgians expected to take advantage of divisions among the Congolese delegates. Most seriously, the representatives from the southern province of Katanga, which controlled the majority of the country's natural resources and industry, wished to form an autonomous state. However, when the Africans landed in Brussels, they pledged to join together with Lumumba's MNC to secure immediate independence. In addition to Congolese strength, the Belgian position was weak. A strong anti-war sentiment among the Belgian youth, economic instability in the Congo, and political feuds within the Belgian government left Belgium in no position to counter Congolese demands. Independence Day was set for June 30, 1960, and the first ever Congolese national elections took place over a week in mid-May. The Congo seemed to have done the impossible. A nation with only two years of political experience had elected its own government, dominated by Lumumba's MNC, which had been so vital in ensuring independence. Lumumba himself, now a national hero, became prime minister. Independence Day had arrived without bloodshed or the Katangan secession many had predicted. On this historic day, King Baudouin delivered his speech to the newly freed Congo. L'indépendance du Congo constitue l'aboutissement de l'œuvre conçue par le génie du roi Léopold II, entreprise par lui avec un courage tenace et continuée avec persévérance par la Belgique. But Lumumba was unwilling to let the king praise the evils of Belgian colonialism. Nous avons connu les ironies, les insultes, les coups que nous devions subir matin, midi et soir parce que nous étions des nègres, qui oubliera qu'à un noir, on disait tu, non certes comme à un ami, mais parce que les vous honorables étaient réservés au seul blanc. This address, the tears, fire, and blood speech, won Lumumba support in the Congo, but aggravated tensions between his country and Belgium. 
These tensions worsened when the forced publique, which thought Lumumba would Africanize the army, decided to mutiny rather than remain under white officers. The force left their barracks and began to harass the wealthy whites. Even though this violence was halted with the election of black officers, Belgium still sent in its army to protect white settlers. Rather than pacifying the Congo, the Belgian presence caused further violence. To the Africans, it seemed the Belgians were attempting to take back the independence given only a week before. Lumumba tried to restore order, but his efforts were stymied by illegal and often unwarranted Belgian intervention. On July 11th, any chance of reconciliation was lost when Katanga finally seceded and Belgium supported the move. Lumumba turned to the United Nations, but Cold War tensions prevented the body from intervening. NATO members were unwilling to harm their ally Belgium by supporting Lumumba. Eventually, a compromise was hammered out in which United Nations soldiers replaced the Belgian troops in every province except secessionist Katanga. There, the UN refused to intervene in the so-called internal affair, allowing the Belgian army to remain and prop up the illegitimate regime. This forced Lumumba to invade Katanga with the force publique. The invasion, combined with his wartime restrictions of civil liberties, convinced his opponents that he had gone too far. Lumumba's chief rival outside of Katanga was Joseph Kasavubu, president of the Congo and leader of the most powerful of the tribal parties. Using an obscure law, President Kasavubu removed Lumumba and many of his ministers from office. Lumumba, in turn, called on parliament, which removed Kasavubu. Lumumba and Kasavubu found themselves at a stalemate. Several attempts were made at reconciliation, but Kasavubu refused. In this power vacuum, Colonel Mobutu, senior commander of the Force Publique in Leopoldville, seized control and placed Lumumba under house arrest. Hoping to regain power, Lumumba attempted to flee to his center of support in Stanleyville, but was captured by Mobutu's soldiers. The Belgian government arranged for Lumumba to be flown to Elizabethville, the stronghold of Shombe's secessionist forces, ensuring his death. On January 17th, he arrived, bound, badly beaten, and missing his glasses. Now, in front of cameras, he was beaten again and forced to eat a transcript of his Independence Day speech. He was never seen nor heard from again. For four weeks, no news of Lumumba came out of Katanga. Finally, on February 13th, Shombe issued an obviously false statement concerning Lumumba's death. The world reacted in shock and outrage. Although the Western government saw Lumumba as a communist, to the people of the world he was, and still is, seen as a nationalist, a hero, and after February 13th, a martyr. It is widely believed he had been killed on the evening of his arrival in Elizabethville by a firing squad commanded by Belgian officers. His body was never recovered. The remains were hacked into pieces, dissolved in acid, and burned. Without Lumumba, the Congo lapsed into a deadly civil war. Ultimately, power passed into the hands of the bloody dictator Colonel Joseph Mobutu, who ruled by fear and violence. While Lumumba's errors played a large role in the collapse of the Congo, they were minor when compared to the actions of Belgium and the inactions of the United Nations. Lumumba played a vital role in securing Congolese independence. He was still the single strongest force of unity in the Congo. He was crucial in uniting the Congolese people enough to force the Belgians to the bargaining table at Brussels in 1960, and his leadership carried the Congo through the force publique mutinies. Today, as the Congo holds its first election since those of 1960, and as Africa struggles under the yoke of poverty and oppression, he is remembered as the embodiment of hope, unity, and the glory that should belong to Africa. His last letter, written shortly before his death, concluded, Africa will write its own history, and to the north and south of the Sahara, it will be a glorious and dignified history. I know that my country, which is suffering so much, will know how to defend its independence and its liberty. Long live the Congo, long live Africa.